Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Centre for Child Protection's Critical Conversations in Child Protection webinar series, season two. This is our very last webinar of season two, so we're glad to see you here. Now, as you might be aware already, the objective of the series is really to promote learning from the latest research, from the latest practice knowledge, theory, lived experiences, all around safeguarding children and young people. It is for multi-professional groups of child protection professionals, including health, education, police, social work, third sector organizations, international child protection, and more. And I, I believe this is all of you who are here right now. Now, the center really aims to get to the heart of child protection training using innovative ideas, as can be seen in our multi-award winning public engagement, impact and research portfolio. We offer um, continuing professional development, certified training sessions using interactive and engaging child protection simulations. This is looking at developing um, an understanding of exploitation, radicalization of children, as well as understanding neglect, courtroom skills in the family court, sexual abuse, and much more. We also deliver a postgraduate program in advanced child protection including a master's, postgraduate diploma, certificate, standalone modules, PhD, which are for multidisciplinary child protection professionals. They're part-time, uh, they're offered through distance and learning approach. So most of our students study alongside full-time work and distance really doesn't matter. We're recruiting now and the closing date for applications is the 1st of December for our January 2024 start. And finally, I wanted to let you know about our MOOC or our massive open online course. It's focused on communication skills on working with vulnerable children. This is free to attend. I think there is a fee if you want a certificate. It already started on the 6th of November, but you can still jump in there and register now and engage with the, the module. I will put a link to all of these things in the chat in just a minute. Now, before I introduce the main event, there are just a couple of housekeeping notes to go over. So first of all, please be aware that this is being recorded um, for a time limited public distribution. Uh, your videos and your microphones are disabled. Um, and this is, you know, very briefly, it's to enable a GDPR sensitive experience for everybody, make sure it's, it runs smoothly and, and everybody's easy uh, to hear and li listen and engage. Speaking of engaging, the chat feature is enabled uh, and we encourage discussion. We really encourage questions, networking, have a chat with each other. A few quick notes about this. Chat is not recorded, so that won't be on any distributed video recording that we put on uh, social media. We do ask that you chat responsibly, respectfully with others as you always have done. Now the presenters will not be able to read and respond to the chat immediately. However, we do have colleagues monitoring the chat and we will answer non-specialist questions and we can pull out questions for the presenter, which will be reserved for the last 10, 15 minutes of the session. So again, please make sure, make, make use of this, I think valuable opportunity to ask questions of Venetia and Isabel. And we will try to get to all questions. If we do run out and if there's anything urgent, do please contact us separately. Finally, please join us on our social media, which has just gone into the chat I can see in there. You can tweet about the event by following at UniKentCCP or hashtag Critical Conversation CP. Okay, now without any more delay, uh, let's get ready for our primary event. So we have Venetia Jassal and Isabel Drew presenting today. Now, Venetia has worked in the Center for Child Protection since its inception in 2012. She's a senior lecturer and director of studies for the center's PG programs and for the MA in social work. She is due to complete her PhD in 2024 on the lived experiences of child sexual abuse amongst Britain's South Asian females. And she's published a chapter of initial findings in a 2022 text titled Child Sexual Abuse in Black and Minoritized Communities. And I will provide a link for this in the chat in just a minute if you want to go and have a look. Isabel is a lecturer also at the Centre for Child Protection and she is our administration admissions lead. She is a registered social worker who has maintained close links with practice alongside her academic endeavours. Isabel teaches across the Centre's postgraduate programmes as well as undergraduate and postgraduate programmes in social work. Now Venetia and Isabel are going to talk with you about what intersectionality and critical race theory has to offer child protection professionals today. So over to you, Venetia and Isabel. Looking forward to today. 
Thank you so much, Tracy. So hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining today's webinar. So this webinar is a follow on from the one I delivered in the last series, which was entitled Addressing Ethnic Inequalities in Child Protection Practice, Why It's Time We Move Beyond Research. So this is still actually available on the Centre for Child Protection's website, as are all of the other sessions that we delivered in series one. So I'm really pleased to be co-delivering this webinar with my colleague Isabel Drew, who brings in some rich practice and wider contextual perspectives to the session. So I want to start by saying that examining the subject of inequalities and disproportionalities of any kind needs to do more than just to remind us of why we need to revisit the topic, but also leave us in inspired and energised to individually and organisationally address the issue. Both Isabel and I therefore hope that the next 45 minutes or so results in clear direction as to how you are going to go about integrating necessary steps towards change in the context of your own practice. Anisha, you've become muted. Sorry. Thanks, Isabel. So the aims of the webinar is to explore why this topic and why now, and briefly explore the current context of having courageous conversations. We want to share and discuss research which evidences ethnic, racial and cultural inequalities in child protection practice and strengthen our understanding of how intersectionality and critical race theory can provide helpful frameworks to support change. We want to bring in the voice of those affected by these inequalities and continue to remain alert to their lived experiences. We want to provide practitioners, yourselves, with a clear rationale and direction to make change. Through my own intersectional research examining British South Asian women's lived experiences of CSA, child sexual abuse, I will illustrate the importance of this theoretical approach in broadening our understanding of risks to children and young people and connecting this to our practice. Isabel has the same objectives when she examines the experience of child Q, a case many of you will know of. This will, will be discussed through the critical race theory lens, and again, linkages to developing practice will be made. And we will be end by sharing some important news about a new group which you may wish to join in 2024, examining culture in child protection. Finally, in the usual fashion of our critical conversation series, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions at the end. I do want to start by making it a little bit interactive for you, though, and I'd like you to go to vvox.app and enter the ID shown there on the slide. So those of you who aren't familiar with vvox, um, it's very simple to use. You literally go to vvox.app and enter that ID and you will have a question which seems to have disappeared from my screen, which says um, it's asking you to just write down a framework or a tool or a model that you know of or which you have used in your practice to address anti-racist, anti-discriminatory or anti-oppressive practice. So anything that you can kind of think of or you know of, any idea, any concept, any training, any model that you, you have kind of encountered in your practice, if you can go on to vbox.app, on your phones, enter that ID and just um, write down what comes to comes to you. And we will come at the end, you know, towards the end of the webinar. We will see what the word cloud has highlighted. So both, as Tracy says, myself and Isabel will be co-presenting this webinar, and it gives me a great, great pleasure to now pass over to Isabel to do, introduce the actual subject of the webinar. So good morning, everybody. Um, really, we started from the position of, of considering kind of um, ethnic, racial and cultural disproportionalities as they're reflected in the practice context and also within the research sphere. So we know that these are deep rooted and um, a significant concern. We really want to move beyond that to consider what do we do about this? Actually, what are the actions that we can take? And we're very much centered on uh, the skills base that you will um, perhaps need to consider as practitioners, and also centering children and young people and their families within this context. Um, we had a, a think about the kind of ethos that we wanted to take forward within the context of this uh, conversation. And we decided that we wanted to 
think about kind of being courageous as central and essential to the critical conversation. And we want to try and practice what we preach. Our focus is on uh, the relationship between theory, research and practice, and really considering how child protection practitioners um, can practice in reality. Some of the information, some of the thinking um, might make us uncomfortable, might be challenging, but we actually want to kind of sit with that discomfort. You know, it, it's, it's, part of, um, it's part of the journey here and it's a necessary part of the journey. It's a valuable engagement. So we're hoping to take that ethos forward. Um, we wanted to acknowledge um, initially the kind of wider context of the UK at this time. Um, the ecosystem, I think, political and economic that we're living in at the moment can sometimes kind of dull, dull our capacity for uh, reflection, analysis, and can challenge some of the application of our learning. So we wanted to acknowledge that difficult context that we're working in. Um, much of our kind of political context at the moment is divisive, polarizing, and kind of atomizes us. And that has an impact on us as practitioners and as academics. We're often invited to enter kind of binary thinking. Um, and really we want to embrace the nuance. So everything that we're thinking about and delivering today is about having that nuanced and sometimes challenging conversation. And we thought we'd set the scene with a, a James Baldwin quote. If only, um, if one really wishes to know how injustice is, is administered in a country, one does not question the police, the lawyers, the judges, or um, the protected members of the middle class. One goes to the unprotected, those precisely who need the law's protection most and listens to their testimony. And that's really central, I think, to the work that we want to think about and introduce today. So the courageous conversations that we're talking about and that idea of discomfort is really um, significant. Um, so we need to kind of sit with discomfort, uncertainty and unknowing. Um, we, we all have something to learn. We all have something um, to develop and reflect on. Uh, we need to be comfortable with that discomfort. Um, we need to think about how we build that discomfort um, into our reflective practice, into the conversations that we might have within our settings, whether they be academic or practice orientated, how we think about those within our organisation. We need to reflect and challenge ourselves. Um, and I think regardless of whether you're um, right at the start of your career um, or right at the end with many years experience, actually that, that kind of self-reflection and challenges is, is really critical. We want to create a supportive and meaningful um, kind of environment where we can take action and, and create change. And uh, that was quite a linear look at it, but actually we can kind of go back and forth along that kind of continuum. So you might feel that you are in a reflective stage now and then discomfort comes back in. That's okay, that's part of the process. So the terms inequalities, disproportionalities and disparities will be used interchangeably in the webinars. It is dependent on the focus of the research papers that may have um, been consulted, but I will in the main employ the term disproportionality because this makes it explicit that there is an imbalance of some sorts in terms of outcomes. Considering the size of the population of different ethnic minority groups, decisions or interventions related to them are not proportionate and the disproportionality is often greater than that for those in the majority white population. And both intersectionality theory and critical race theory, less so currently in the UK, um, but they do both offer important insights into the disproportionalities which exist in across UK child protection practice. The theories themselves will be explored later on, but I think it's useful to have a reminder of what these disproportionalities and disparities actually are. So I want to start by looking at some of the um, research around this area. So Laird and Williams in their two, 2023 paper, um, an applied model in cultural competence in child protection, encompass a number of previous research papers to remind us that discriminatory decision making in child protection systems is leading to disproportionate numbers subject to investigation and, inter and intervention. We also have um, a set of research here, which highlights and reminds us again about the overrepresentation of African and mixed heritage children and the underrepresentation of Asian children. 
The Ferguson paper discusses the overrepresentation of children in a legal context and is included in a law journal. So it's quite an interesting read. And the author argues that once cases reach court, overrepresentation cannot be adequately addressed. And what is interestingly pointed out is that cases do not tend to be contested by ethnic minoritized families. And the paper concludes with an important statement that families must reach court for the right reason. So I think that's quite profound. The Armand et al. paper here um, is actually a report, is a report that was produced as part of the Independent Review into Children's Social Care recently. And it shows some concerning data here in that more than double the proportion of children from Asian, Black and any and those categorised as any other ethnic groups entered care following no social care activity compared to all other children. So Asian children, this figure was 42%, Black children 37%, and the any other category 46%, compared to 19% for all other ethnic groups. So this implies that quicker decisions and transitions into care are happening and possibly less support measures, which has been found to be the case in historical research as well. We, we know that already that the transitions into care can be quicker uh, for certain ethnic minority groups. So I just want to move on to practice now with some specific examples to illustrate these disproportionalities and impact and how they impact lived experiences, which will be further explored by Isabel. So starting with the concept of adultification, which some of you may have heard of, is this is a concept which rather than seeing the innocence and vulnerability of black children, and it is a concept which is mainly um, employed in terms of examining the experiences of black children. So rather than seeing their innocence and vulnerability, we may tend to see them as um, in, in the, through the lens of responsibility and culpability. And Isabel, like I said, will discuss that further. And the work of Davis has unpacked this in a number of contexts, including in her uh, 2019 um, research with the probation service. All the references that Isabel and I cite have been provided at the end. Constance Huggins examined the risks to black girls through sex trafficking in a US context, um, but, it, but it is applicable also to the UK in terms of uh, some of her findings. And uh, the author discusses how race is a significant factor in risks to the girls being minimized or practice to protect them being ineffective or even poor resulting from social workers having certain ideas or beliefs of their of the girl's willing participation or them being treated more like an adult. And my own research, which I'll talk about later in more detail, looks at, lo looks at how low child sexual abuse referral rates from the South Asian communities has only been seen through the lens of cultural barriers, which really limits our understanding of the issue. Moving on to... Um, the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse report which came out um last year yeah last year so this this found that organizations did not respond recognize sorry or support the cultural and religious needs of victims theory we will look at um in coming slides in a bit more detail because that is a, the, the um, key part of this seminar it's passing over to isabel um, so we wanted to um, include uh, thinking about the kind of impacts of inequalities, disproportionality and discrimination on lived experience. And um, the publication by Bernard and Harris is a really helpful way to consider this. And they did a systematic review of serious case reviews that are now known as local child safeguarding practice reviews back in 2019. And they found some, um, I think, some of these areas are well understood and well known, but actually it was interesting to look in this particular area. So they found that serious case reviews uh, reflect a lack of professional curiosity regarding the lived experience and emotional lives of children. And um, we've been aware, I think, of um, this aspect um, and concern for a number of years within child protection. But I think, think again about the disproportionality that Venetia was just talking about when it comes to black and minoritized children. Children's wishes, feelings, and emotional worlds were frequently unknown to practitioners. So that engagement still has some very significant limitations. So they talk very um, eloquently about kind of direct work, observation, 
and understanding the kind of contextual considerations. Um, and this lack of child-centered practices is likely to disproportionately impact on minoritized children. Professionals frequently underestimate the risks to older children and regularly kind of entered into kind of racialized and gendered discourses. Um, and I'll speak to that issue, I think, some more within um, the analysis of child view. The recording of children's ethnicity was frequently incomplete, inaccurate, and inconsistent. Um, and that is um, a, a failure that's seen across um, agencies, but actually we're still not getting the basics right. So it, it really undermines um, our capacity to understand. The coalescence and impact of um, multiple inequalities is frequently overlooked and disconnected from the lived experience of parents and children. So that thinking about things in the round was um, frequently absent from serious case reviews. They weren't really joining the dots. They weren't understanding that lived experience. There was a lack of professional curiosity in relation to the prominence of race in children's lives. So actually race and identity were infrequently centered as a, a consideration within serious case reviews and something that might contribute to our understanding and therefore um, development in our practice. Um, reflections on bias and beliefs around race, culture and religion are not sufficiently discussed and um, to support practitioners' understanding of how these might influence their work with minoritized children. Again, having quite a um, limited and sometimes superficial understanding of children's experiences. And Bernard and Harris noted, um, what the serious case view does not explore is the process whereby professionals' assumptions and stereotypes became entrenched. So there was a lack of kind of a reflective capacity within the serious case review, nor to ask what mechanisms might have helped uh, to challenge these fixed beliefs, to open them up to scrutiny and ensure that antipressive practice in the face of institutional and social um, racism was kind of considered. So we still have a very considerable journey around um, considerations of um, black and minoritized children within these contexts. Okay, so moving on to intersectionality theory. So intersectionality theory originated as a tool to analyze the effects of race and gender, the intersections of race and gender discrimination in, in black lives, specifically um, black women. And Kimberly Crenshaw, um, who I'm sure all of you will know of now, in 1989 um, brought this concept into the fore. And other feminist scholars such as Bra and Phoenix continued to examine the importance of our multiple realities realities and how this impacts us in everyday interactions. However, the explicit use of intersectionality as a framework is relatively recent in child welfare literature. And the primary focus has generally been on intersections of race and gender, as opposed to service response and um, need. So I'm just going to briefly um, sum up some of the papers. So Cho et al, um, including um, Crenshaw, as an author within within that paper, really argue for the value of an intersectional approach as being an, a practical approach, not only theoretical. So th sometimes as practitioners, a lot of the theories remain as theories and quite inaccessible. And this paper really sets out how intersectionality, the framework, is a very practical approach. And so it's really relevant for all of us here today. Um, Begum's paper in 2018, her research, actually her PhD thesis, um, brings in the intersections of race and gender, looking at South Asian child sexual abuse amongst um, males. Um, and it's, it's one of the earlier pieces of research which really um, does that in the context of child sexual abuse. And Davis's research, I've already spoken, uh, spoken about her research and not only the 2019 research, but other pieces of research also looks at the adultification concept and in terms of um, black children and uh, their experiences in the child protection system. And my research um, also speaks to the um, ethnicity and gender intersection, looking at child sexual abuse of females in South Asian communities. And then if we move over here, we start to use intersectionality in a little bit of a different way with intersections of ethnicity and socioeconomic context. And so we know that children and families who come to uh, who become known to us generally poverty is a factor 
Um, and so this 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 developing area of research is really interesting. So Weber et al. in 2020 showed that poverty is an important factor in explaining why rates of inter intervention um, happen. That's, there's no surprises there. But what they found was that there is there are kind of nuanced differences between ethnic groups. Um, so the research examined data sets across several ethnic groups and found variations in terms of interventions. And when we talk about interventions, we're, we're talking about child protection, child in need and children looked after. So three sets of interventions. And there was quite interesting variations across the um, ethnic groups. Um, for example, Asian Pakistani rates differed significantly for child protection plan interventions and the rates taken into care. So there was quite a significant difference compared to other ethnic groups. And Black Caribbean populations had significantly different children in child in need and ch children looked after intervention rates. So we don't have time to go into all the different variations, but what, what that research did start to highlight is that we, that just grouping ethnic minority or BME um, as, a, as just a single category often loses those uh, subtle differences between ethnic group, minority groups themselves. Bywaters there are found that ethnicity again was an important factor underlying inequalities with black children far more likely to be living in the most deprived 20% of neighborhoods. And the CLA children looked after rates for mixed black and other children were higher than for white children. But Asian children had the lowest rates of child looked after interventions. So those are really important um, findings and they refer back to the research I was highlighting earlier in terms of over-representation and under-representation of um, some groups of um, some group communities. If we go over here in terms of gender and migration, Midel et al. found that an intersectional lens allowed for disparities according to gender and migration with female migrants in in this uh, in in the Scand in the Scandinavian country in which this research was undertaken were assessed more punitively so if you were a female and you were a migrant female your the interventions tended to be more punitive and more and um, you know, not so supportive to the family so that's again is a quite an interesting inter intersection there and if we move over this, this is developing research, research by Schmid and Shaikh Zaydigan, and they undertook some cross-country um, comparisons looking at looked after children of Muslim heritage and the intersections of ethnicity and religion. Because what they found was, well, this is this is definitely an under-researched area um, and the importance of faith to some children and young people across all communities. Um, but what they found was that practitioners were raising some concern about conceptual tools and interventions to effectively support the Muslim community. And they wanted to be more sensitive to the religious communities. And this is really important uh, for us in the UK today. Um, because we know that many of our unaccompanied asylum seeking children are of Muslim heritage. And in 2023, the Home Office reported that under 6,000 under 18s apply, uh, were applying for asylum. So we do need to understand that the importance of religion and faith to some, not all. So it's really important whenever we're talking about this topic that we don't generalize every every everybody and every child and every family within what we're saying and um, but their research showed that for, for some children religion and faith was really important so when they were being placed in the care system those did need to be um, considered and where they were the children did have a better lived experience of being in care so in short the theory allows practitioners to move beyond the safeguarding framework frameworks which have historically been eurocentric and it encourages practitioners to link the micro with the macro structural context impacting minoritized communities, um, such as the legacy of colonialism on black children, which Davis, Janine Davis talks about, or the deep sense of community and concerns about shame and honor, which I talk about in my own research, or the importance of faith and religion, as I said, um, as I've just shared in terms of Schmid and Shaikh Zaydegan. So it's about making th these links with the macro, which impact um, the lived experiences. So just moving on to my research. So my research, as I said, has examined child sexual abuse in Britain and South Asian communities, focusing on female survivors only. And as previously discussed at length in series one, the rates of referral uh, for child sexual abuse are disproportionately low from South Asian communities. 
And there's been a significant set of research illustrating this, and you know, including academic government commission and independent independently commissioned research by the Children's Commissioner. The 2022 Independent Inquiry into Child Sexual Abuse Report, uh, written by JAL, is one of the most recent reports and also um, speaks to this statistic, this, this data being disproportionately low and being concerned about that. So the intersection of gender and ethnicity has enabled me as a researcher to have a deeper examination of the lived experiences of British South Asian women. As we know, as a female, you're at much higher risk of experiencing child sexual abuse. Gender was therefore an important starting point for the research, with data indicating the prevalence, obviously, of male perpetrated child sexual abuse against females being the um, the, the highest rate of, of child sexual abuse, the highest model of child sexual abuse of, of male perpetrated violence or abuse against females. And through the literature review briefly shared earlier, it was known that child sexual abuse in British South Asian communities was little known about and that these communities were known to be facing particular barriers to reporting. And often shame and honour was cited as the reason for this. Now, these are powerful and embedded constructs in South Asian communities and can impact an individual significantly. In the context of domestic and sexual violence, the constructs have been known to be a major barrier for women in seeking help and support from agencies. And I sought to provide a more fulsome knowledge base of the influence and impact of these same constructs for female South Asian victim survivors of child sexual abuse. So an intersectional lens has allowed granular insights into how shame and honour affected the women's experience of child sexual abuse and through including how strongly it led from them being governed by associated norms of how to dress and behave and from a very early age into the present day for some these constructs have forever been there and some felt that they would not be supported precisely due to these constructs and leading them not to disclose and remain silent even to this day. So this inter intersectional approach has really allowed for this dual vulnerability for these women to become known on a more deeper level. So I just want to read quickly the, some of the quotes from the, from the data. The blame is always going to be on the woman so sometimes it's best not to say anything as the blame will always be on you. So obviously I've used pseudonyms here, but Layla is sharing with me that there's just no point in disclosing or going to anyone with anything because these constructs have governed um, this this inequality to such an extent that the, the woman will always be blamed, even though she's the victim. And Zara, who's quite an activist and really kind of engaged in my research because she wanted to make real change, said that hopefully our generation is going to change and let girls know that you don't have to hold all of this on your shoulders. It's not just girls who hold the shame. And then if something goes wrong, it's the girls who gets punished, who gets punished as well. When the man does wrong, the girl gets punished. When the girl does wrong, the girl gets punished. So the man gets away scot-free every single time and it's not fair. So they're really kind of powerfully, through through my narrative analysis approach, their stories were really told in, in a really authentic way. Um, and Shuram and Izzat finally um, from Sauna play a huge part in my life, she said. They're constantly there like a shadow that will never leave you kind of thing. So really just to show very briefly how that intersectional approach, if I had just looked at gender, child sexual abuse, and just um, in it from a gender lens, there's no way I would have been able to get the perspective of this group, these group, this group of women. So just moving on to term, in terms of making this all practical for you, as we promised at the start. So while scholars and educators in Britain have a long history in developing and teaching models of anti-oppressive and anti-discriminatory practices, which incorporate anti-racism, this hasn't lessened the disproportionate number of children from racial and ethnic minorities entering the British child protection system. So that is a point of concern and something for you to sort of sit with. Addressing ethnic diversity through a cultural competence framing, framing has received little attention. So there's some research to show that we don't actually give enough attention. Um, and even though this is quite dated research, I, I think we will find that even now practitioners find it quite difficult to grasp cultural competency and how to actually make it happen in practice, hence this webinar. Um, 
Batty Sinclair and Pri um, Price and Bernard and Harris, as Isabel has already shared, discuss that child safeguarding practice reviews lack critical analysis of race and culture, which limits an effective assessment of the significance of race and cultural issues. And being educationists, we will always talk about education and training. So there is a role of education and training. And the authors here, Eg Egon's daughter et al, found that um, using simulative learning and being the Centre for Child Protection, we know simulative learning works. Um, they have a simulation called Child Stim, which was really useful in helping students to examine their own biases in decision making. And I've just added this really in terms of my own thinking around deviations when we're trying to address these problems. Do we start to become preoccupied by other things because this subject is for some reason, as Isabel says, too uncomfortable, too difficult to grasp. Um, do we start to get distracted by other things, such as the terminology? So it's quite interesting that anti-racism became anti-discrimination and then became anti-oppressive. Um, you know, are we do we get caught up on terminology, data rather than anything else? workloads training do we feel we're not we haven't got enough training and obviously the politically and economic context and um, does that influence how we think about this problem as Isabel said at the outset we can't divorce that we live in a divorce ourselves from the fact that we live in a very divisive community at the moment so we want to leave you with some models um to take away if you haven't heard of some of these it's it's really important that you you do try to look up some models if you don't have any frameworks to draw upon. So the ASKED model of cultural competency provides practical implementations of anti-oppressive practices with Black, Asian and ethnic minorities families. And it was first introduced by Laird and Tadam in 2019. And the current 2023 paper by Laird and Williams discusses it again. So I just want to share briefly with you, with you how it works. So it's got five stages. It's a cultural awareness. It's about recognising how our values and beliefs shape our interpretation of the observed and experienced, including our perceptions of people from a different cultural background. So it's very personal, this journey. Cultural skill, the ability to collect, comprehend and accurately analyse cultural information regarding beliefs, values and practices relevant to a family's needs and problems as part of the assessment and care planning process. Comprom Cultural knowledge is comprises of searching for and acquiring detailed information about other cultures, faiths and ethnic groups while avoiding stereotyping. So there is a lot to this, but it's about trying to um, get familiar with it. Cultural encounter means going beyond mere interaction with families from ethnically diverse backgrounds. It requires meaningful cross-cultural engagement which modifies the practitioner's existing beliefs and perceptions regarding a particular ethnic group. And finally, cultural desire. This is an important one. This concerns the practitioner's motivation to want to, rather than have to, engage in the above four processes. It encompasses a willingness to accept differences, recognise similarities and learn from family members themselves about their culture and faith. Isabel. Okay, so um, I would like to introduce you, and you may well have some familiarity with um, critical race theory, um, but we're particularly thinking about critical race theory within the context of child protection. Um, there are some limitations, I think, on the, um, the evidence base, the literature that's currently uh, available to us around critical race theory within the UK setting. Um, there is a, 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 a plethora of information from uh, North America and a, a positive development of critical race theory literature from um, Australia. Um, I hope that this is an area that we um, invest in, I think, as child protection practitioners as a framework for understanding um, some of the continuing and entrenched failings around uh, disproportionality and race and racism within our context. Um, I think it's worth pointing out that there has been some um, controversy around critical race theory, political controversy around critical race theory that is relevant to the UK setting. Um, it's certainly not um, considered a, a welcome um, theoretical frame by um, the, the, the current political, um, uh, well, the current government. Um, and within the context of Black Lives Matter and the, and the kind of 
ongoing discourse after that, there was quite a lot of explicit discussion around um, and challenge to critical race theory within the UK setting. Um, I'd like to start with the uh, kind of five tenets of critical race theory. Um, so I think this gives you a, a very clear sphere as to what critical race theory, how it wants to engage, and I think how uncompromising it is as, as, a, um, as a tool, as a theoretical uh, framework for us. So the first tenet is that racism is ordinary, it's business as usual. Um, it's it's entrenched, it's woven into our institutions, it's um, naturalised within our um, cultural contexts. The second tenant is um, around interest convergence, and really that um, racial equality is often contingent on majority self-interest. So again, I think that gives us real food for thought around how we develop our own thinking and practice within child protection and how we reflect on some of the findings and thinking that Venetia was uh, just discussing a moment ago. The third tenet of critical race theory is that race is a social construct and actually the experience of race and racism is um, diverse and nuanced and is uh, different for different groups of people. So again, not having that um, idea of a kind of homogenous group is very, very important. It's actually asking us to um, seek an understanding from, um, from the base, actually understanding it from the perspective of people. Um, the fourth tenet of critical race theory is the importance of storytelling and narrative, and actually exploring and centering um, those voices that are seldom heard, um, and really uh, challenging the kind of hegemonic um, constructs that were often given as kind of natural and neutral. So um, it, it has real value. There is also the fifth tenet, which is about the kind of um, the legislative legitimization of inequalities, often through ideas of things like meritocracy. So just to be clear, critical race theory provides a framework for examining power constructs that maintain racial inequalities um, and develop strategy for action and change. And it's really about that change that's vital. Next slide, please. So, um, I'm going to be talking about uh, the case of child Q um, and really thinking about how we can apply critical race theory within uh, this context. Um, I've taken from uh, two areas that I've worked in. So I presented to Jay Swift in 2022 around the, the kind of malignant spectre of institutional racism and safeguarding and focused very much on uh, the case of child Q at that time. And the second, um, piece of literature that I draw from is a, a chapter that has recently been published that explores and reimagines um, kind of child protection within a kind of decolonizing lens. Next, next slide, please. So you may well be very familiar with, um, with the case of child cube. I wanted to explore why it's important. Um, so the local child safeguard and practice review that was completed by Jim Gamble in Hackney for a um, child group explicitly named and, ex um, and responded to race and racism within the findings and recommendations. Um, and it made links within the safeguarding context. And these were really, really explicit links within the safeguarding context. Um, that's important as we have looked at um, Bernard and Harris that actually that is very infrequently undertaken. So this was a real sea change um, really for, um, for safeguarding reviews. It was a case that also made that jump into the public domain in a way that some serious case reviews do. And it really um, chimed with the public and made headlines. And that's very, very important to, to consider. Um, it has real political and social importance within the context of our current practice. So that's why I think it's important for us to look at that today. Next slide, please. So there are a couple of concepts that I think are important for us to think about at the outset when we're thinking about critical race theory. And these are the ideas of institutional racism that I think we've become um, unfortunately very familiar with in, in the past uh, few years. You'll be familiar with the McPherson report and it's, um, it's kind of idea of what it is, what institutional racism is. So 
they identify uh, the collective failure of an organisation to provide an appropriate um, and professional service to people because of their colour, cultural or ethnic origin. But I would like you to look at the second quote there. Um, institutional racism is that which covertly or overtly resides in the policies, procedures, operations and culture of public and private institutions. And I think that idea of being covert or overt is very, very important in this analysis. Reinforcing individual prejudices and become and being reinforced by them in turn. So I think that's um, a much more helpful approach, perhaps, to the idea of institutional racism. Next slide, please, Minister. The other concept that I think is important within this analysis of child Q and thinking about critical race theory is the idea of unconscious bias. Marcelin talks about unconscious or implicit bias describing uh, associations or attitudes that reflectively alter our perceptions, thereby affecting behaviour, interactions and decision making. And I think that's a helpful way to consider unconscious bias. But again, I think I would signpost you within this context to Kate and Paige, which I think are much more uncompromising, I think, in their analysis of um, unconscious bias. So they consider unconscious bias as uh, ceasing to be just a phrase, a gesture towards so-called unwitting racism. Unconscious bias has become even more prevalent within institutions, transmogrified into corporate training as an essential uh, account, accountant. So they, they are really saying that sometimes the, the idea of unconscious bias has been um, diluted in some ways. And I think we have to be really mindful of that within our analysis. Next slide, please, Commissioner. So just to give you a very brief case overview. So um, in 2020, Child Q, a black female child at secondary school age, was script searched by female officers of the Metropolitan Police Service. Um, teachers uh, told the review that on the day of the search, they believed that Child Q smelt of um, cannabis, and they did have um, an initial search within the school. Um, she was searched without an appropriate adult. It was a very intimate search. It was um, a very brutal intervention. And, and what has come to light since then is how um, unfortunately frequent those sorts of brutal in interventions are for black and minoritized children um, in more general terms. Next slide, please, Manisha. In line with the ideas of critical race theory, I really wanted to um, centre the voice of the child and family within this context. And what we know, and this is all taken from the series case review document that was completed by Hackney um, and published. And I, if you haven't looked at that, I would, I would strongly advise you to do that. I think it's a, a really interesting piece of analysis and a very uncompromising piece of analysis. And certainly thinking about the impact on child Q, that actually her family were very clear that she was let down badly, that she was criminalised, and above all, the view that child Q was treated differently because of her ethnicity and race. And there were quotes directly from child Q within the context of the serious case review. All the people that allowed this to happen need to be held responsible. I was held responsible for a smell. And she actually talks about that journey for her. Um, so I think centering that, centering those voices is, is important. It's important in relation to critical race theory and it's important in relation to our practice. Next slide, please, Manisha. So I'm just going to look at a couple of examples. Again, this was taken from the review and sits alongside relevant literature. So if you look to 5.1, across many of the professionals involved that day, there was an absence of safeguarding first approach within their practice. So the review overwhelmingly felt that there was a criminal justice response to child Q. And if we think about the literature and the evidence um, to the right, young black people explained that, and this was in the context of education, young black people explained that some teachers automatically view young black people as less capable, unintelligent and aggressive. So this was the voice of, of children and young people within this context. Uh, stereotype stigmatized um, uh, areas that were considered were things like class, culture, and that they were often framed as kind of feckless. 
So these very problematic ideas, these existing ideas that are based on, often on age, on um, race and on class, were, were really borne out in the literature. Next slide, please, Venetia. So um, if you look to 5.73 from the review, in reflecting on how adultification bias might have been evident in the practice with child care, this can be seen in the fact that she received a largely criminal justice and disciplinary response from the adults around her, rather than child protection response. And if you look to the top, um, within Davies and Marsh, which has already been um, discussed in part by Venetia, we wanted to be clear about what adultification is. So adultification occurs when black children are perceived as being less innocent and less vulnerable, and subsequently not afforded the same protection as their non-black peers. So the, uh, you can see from the review how, um, how significant disproportionality, race and racism was to the experience of this child. Next slide, please. So at 5.39, in terms of the strip search of child view, practice that day appeared to have been um, far, you know, way towards um, criminal responsibility and criminal justice. It might also um, relate to uh, elements of disproportionality and racism. So there was again an explicit, an explicit response from the review. Um, so, and if you look at um, 5.40, it was also the lack of action taken after the strip search that showed child who was primarily being seen as the risk rather than being at risk. So her position in this was really, really problematized by the practitioners around her. And these were multidisciplinary practitioners, um, including school safeguarding team, metropolitan police, and subsequently the local authority social care team. If we think about um, uh, Joseph Salisbury um, at bottom 2020, in the absence of a strong discourse on institutional racism and anti-racism, the language of diversity, inclusion and equality seems to have become much more um, kind of legitimacy and pal um, pal palatability within schools. So this dilution of really focusing on race and racism is something that I think is very problematic. So such language is often wrapped up as colorblind, and uh, that again diminishes our um, potential to analyze. And critical race theory really brings that into sharp focus. Next slide, please, Venetia. So just to highlight the findings of the review very briefly. So the key findings that I think um, really relate to an understanding of critical race theory and the experience of child view. School, school staff deferred to the authority of police on their um, arrival to school. So there was a real hierarchy of um, kind of professional practice there. School staff had uh, an insufficient focus on safeguarding and safeguarding needs for child care, which I think is very evident from the review. The absence of any specific requirement to seek parental consent really undermined parental responsibility. And actually it was child care that informed her parent of her strip search at the end of the school day. So that absence is really, really profound. Racism, whether deliberate or not, was likely to have been an influencing factor in the decision to undertake the strip search. So I think this, this series case review, um, I think illustrates um, the, the significance of race within the context of child protection, but also reflects to us the areas that we might consider for change. Next slide, please, Venetia. I just wanted to um, kind of finish this area of child cue um, with this idea of um, the web of institutional racism. And uh, Miller and Gowan really talk about this very eloquently. The web of institutional ra racism is painfully obvious to people of color that are caught in the strands and yet nearly invisible to many white people who pass through unimpeded. I think that's a, a, an important takeaway. Identifying and mapping the web of institutional racism pins it to the wall of the individual and collective consciousness. So actually having these ideas embedded within our practice 
makes us far more likely, um, with perhaps with that discomfort, with that anxiety, to engage in these difficult and critical conversations. Next slide, please. So just a, a brief synopsis of the application of um, critical race theory within the case of child B. Critical race theory offers a constructive and in-depth response to injustice and a robust framework for analysis. It centers the person and their experience and narrative, as is a central tenant to critical race theory, offers a systemic and systematic approach to the wide ranging links of the personal and the political. So those ideas about how we can look at the systems fully as well as reflect on our own experiences. It recognizes the importance of challenging our own values, norms, and thinking through those courageous conversations and changes within our own organizations. Critical race theory um, could be further developed within the context of child protection to support critical discourse and to respond to disproportionality, discrimination, and racism. So there's real value to thinking about this theoretical framework, but really thinking about its application to practice. Next slide, please, Venetia. So I thought I would end with um, reference to, I think, a changing landscape within practice. And this is um, taken from an article by Millie Kerr, who's one of an emerging group of um, anti-racism leads within local authorities. And um, there are a number, and I would, I would um, encourage you to go out and look at these. And she really looked at ways in which uh, individuals and organisations can think about how we have courageous conversations, how we have difficult, uncomfortable discussions. So she talked about the building of confidence of practitioners um, to have these conversations, so actually thinking about strategies to do that. Considering race, ethnicity and culture is not an addendum, it should be a central pillar of professional practice. So those margins that we've seen this to, to sit in um, to this point need to change. It needs to be centralised. It needs to be an important part of planning within organisations. Every aspect of practice needs to reflect the centrality of race, ethnicity and culture. So if you think about this within child protection, it would be within, it would sit within consultations, decision making processes, assessments and review, and not in a superficial way, in a very um, grounded way with those people at the centre. Relationships and community are key to safe, supportive professional practice. We need to support staff to explore and share their narratives. Um, again, critical race theory, it's a central tenant. It's important that we hear from people with experience. Critical reflection within, within individual supervision, group, team meetings and tailored sessions. So something that is an ongoing part of the organisational discourse and debate. Um, develop training that speaks directly to the lived experience of racism and discrimination. So again, this is not, and I think this has been one of the problematic areas, that quite often it's been black and minoritized practitioners that have been asked to come up with the solutions. Those voices are really, really important, but actually the, the onus, the responsibility lies with the organization, the institutions, and us as individuals. Any planning within, in, within institutions should be scrutinized by um, participants and responsive to changes and developments. So having an action plan is wonderful, but actually reviewing that on a regular basis and testing how well we're doing against it. So it's not a, a, a kind of a static position for us to have these courageous conversations. It's about an ongoing discourse and a challenging discourse. Anisha. Thank you, Isabel. I'm just going to finish off with this quote here, uh, which builds up and uh, follows on from what Isabel was just saying. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'll speed it up. Failure to recognise the significance of culture, and I've had I've added the highlights, is in the end a kind of racism. It can result in a kind of professional immobilisation in which difference may be ignored or wrongly attributed to cultural difference rather than the problems of certain individuals. Underlying this, there is a confusion concerning the implications of cultural relatives, relativism and inability to sort out what differences in child rearing practice can be acceptable in the context of contemporary society and what cannot be accepted. And just want to let you all know that the conversation that we're having today is continuing with Isabella and I in terms of our role with the Association of Child Protection Professionals who work with quite closely in the centre. 
um, and they have um, a range of special interest groups and we're launching a new one culture in child protection from next year so you are welcome to join those meetings and if you're interested in hearing more you can find out more from this link so the slides will be available but also you can email myself um, on that contact email there too if you want to continue engaging with us on this references have been provided and i am now going to go and ask for some questions and while i hand back over to tracy i will try to look up the v box lovely thanks Venetia. what an insightful valuable and important session with principles and practices that need to be kept at the forefront of practice we could do a whole week talking about this um, I can see your talk has generated some thanks and some appreciations uh, for the space for this discussion, but I'm going to jump right into questions as we have a few. Um, I, I just want everyone to know I'm going to ask all the questions um, and they will remain, uh, the recording will remain on. So to those in attendance, if you need to leave, you can pick up on the responses um, in the recording later, but if possible, please stay while we go over them now. Um, so to start with, um, to what extent do you both find Laming's findings on Victoria Colombier's case, Child Safety First, has affected thinking and assumptions around intersectionality? So could you repeat that question, Tracy? Sure. To what extent do you find uh, Laming's findings in Victoria Colombier's case has affected thinking and assumptions around intersectionality? Um, I, I don't think... I mean, I'm trying. I'm going to try to be remain optimistic, but I think there there were some very interesting, important findings from the Layman review and the whole Victoria Columbia case, um, and we still cite that a lot in the centre when we teach. Um, but unfortunately, I think it does. Um, I don't think it, they have materialised into practice sufficiently because of the reasons Isabel and I have outlined. I think there are barriers to making that happen in practice. And often that lies with practitioners not feeling confident or not having the support in their organisations to make make real change. So I think I think it's been very limited my response. I don't know if Isabel has has another response. Uh, yeah, I think I think I mean it, it was um it, it was actually my early practice period that the Victoria Columbia um well, Laming Review was um, published, and I think there was a groundswell at that point of a kind of understanding and investment, but that has, um, to an extent, fallen by the wayside for lots and lots of complex reasons. Um, so I, I think it, it it gave impetus, but I think there were some real limitations, and I, I don't think we've kind of borne the fruit. I mean, that was that was twenty years ago. Um, so I think you know one of the things that we were really interested in within the webinar was. We know a lot, actually, we need to think about action. We need to think about actionable um, things that we can do within practice and within uh, within research context. So yes, very limited, I'm afraid. Nicely put, both of you, thank you. Um, the next question is social graces. Uh, I'm not uh, graces. There's lots of S's and G's and A's, but I'm just gonna call them social graces. This training has become more commonplace in local authorities. What's your view about the helpfulness of this to support an intersectional approach? Um, I, I, I've got a lot of time for the graces. I think they're a really valuable tool. Um, however, I think that they need to be bolstered by both intersectionality and critical race theory. Um, so I think they can work in partnership. Um, I, I suppose I speak to um, some of the literature that I sometimes worry about this dilution and about the kind of dilution of the discourse. And I think the graces can be really valuable, but I think they need to sit within a um, within within a, a, a an explicitly um, anti-racist and critical theoretical framework. Yeah, I would just echo that. And I think this is a reason why we didn't just have a webinar on intersectionality theory, because we actually thought it wasn't going to go far enough. So I think uh, Isabel's right that you do have to bring in critical race theory to really understand um, the, the um, you know, the, 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 the impact that graces can have in our actual practice. Wonderful. Again, thank you. Um, how do you think social work can think more carefully about differences between culture and ethnicities? And is the term BAME helpful to practice? 
I'll take that one just because we're we're kind of relooking at the name Bain for the staff network at the university, and I think I think it's not helpful really. In inter in, in a, the short answer to that is it's not very helpful because uh, for lots of reasons. But I do I do feel that we can sometimes get caught up on terminology and the language. Um, and really that takes us away from the actual issue about differences between culture and ethnicities and what they actually mean for lived experiences. So I think social workers can, uh, you know, always hopefully try to keep the uh, service issues in mind, the child at the centre of everything that they're doing. And, and the intersectionality framework really helps you with that and looking at the child as a whole, um, you know, not just their ethnicity, but also the other intersections that also are, may well be important in their lives. Uh, yeah, I would echo that. I think critical race theory and that kind of centering and the the kind of the, the kind of storytelling and narrative of people with experiences is is really valuable and should be um I think much better and much more robustly considered within child protection and um, more broadly across um you know children's social care and other networks. Tracy, you're on mute. Sorry, two more questions. One, how can practitioners learn to challenge discriminatory language present in their institution? Um, I would say um, that's where these tools come in really, um, they're, they're really, really valuable. Actually, with a, with a good working knowledge of intersectionality and critical race theory, I think that gives you um, some of the language and some of the thinking that you need to have those difficult conversations, to have those those um, uncomfortable conversations that are sometimes um, perhaps minimised or or marginalised um, because of the discomfort and because of people's. Um, I, I suppose I'm not sure what what I would call it. I think there is still a lot of. Um, there is a lot of concern around entering into these discourses, but I think that's where intersectionality and critical race theory are really valuable to have those conversations. Should I go to the last question? Um, and that is, do you get a sense of the education of child protection professionals, for example, social workers, have these ideas embedded in their educational pre-practice and you know experiences and if not what do you suggest educational institutions should do to embed these things I think it varies I mean Isabel and I both teach these this subject to students at the University of Kent and I think um it, it's often you know one week's lecture in the in the 12 weeks of a semester and can get very easily diluted in in terms of you know real impact and real thinking so I think I think we all have something to take away from this in terms of in integrating it and and it depends on institutions it depends on who's teaching what their what their um area of research is what how how motivated they are as educationists to bring this topic to their students in a really fulsome way so if you're at the University of Kent I think you'd benefit quite a lot and and we we really integrate it into the social work department the center for child protection and how we teach but you know i can't speak for all institutions so it very much depends really but i think um you know it's really important that pre qualifying as well as post qualifying that that the strand remains constant and consistent and regular i would um i would say that i mean thinking about critical race theory particularly um, I think the controversy and the challenge and the pushback that there's been on critical race theory has um, energised discourse within education around its utility and around its value. Um, but certainly I think that there, there is a lot of opposition to the integration of critical race theory within higher education and, and, and you know, all the way through the education system with children. I think another useful thing that we can consider is, I know there's been lots of discussion about decolonising the curriculum, but actually part of decolonizing the curriculum is decolonizing our minds and those ideas that kind of woven in nature, I think of um, disproportionality and discrimination and race. So deconstructing and decolonizing our thinking as educators, as practitioners, as learners is as important. Well said. 
Lovely, wonderful, thank you. Um, just to say in closing up, I put links to chapters that both Isabel and Venetia have written in the chat. Sadly, Isabel's chapter is not open access, but I did notice that the book Future of Children's Care, Critical Perspectives on Children's Services Reform, which she had an image of earlier, is on sale right now on Amazon. So not that I'm advertising anything, do what you want to do. Um, and finally, can I just say thank you very much to Visibel, Visibel, <laughs> Venetia and there. Isabel. <laughs> I like that. Again, a very valuable session uh, to conclude our season two of Critical Conversations in Child Protection. Everybody, please look out for session three in the autumn 2024. And in the meantime, again, thank you to everyone for participating, asking some great questions, and generally for your commitment to work, the work you do in child protection. So thank you again, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.